All right, welcome everyone. This is um, the uh, Social Responsibility Interest Section Special Webinar, Diversifying TESOL Working Towards Inclusivity. All right, so we're gonna go ahead, we're going to start with introductions. We're going to set the stage and discuss what the words diversity and inclusion mean to you, as well as let our wonderful panelists do their presentations. We'll end with the Q&A and discussion and closing. Okay, so first of all, I wanna talk a little bit about what you think the words diversity and inclusion mean to you. So if all of you can type in the chat, the first things you think about when you just when you think about diversity and inclusion. And since I don't see the chat, if Raya, if you want to read off some of their answers. Well, I guess I have a problem with the Sure. Diversity. So I see diversity being different experiences and perspectives, um, honoring multiple viewpoints. If anyone else has any associations, um, they can't happen if equity and liber liberation aren't included. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any other thoughts? Diversity means working and learning from people around the world, including everyone from different backgrounds. Diversity relates to representation. Inclusion means listening and accessing diverse perspectives as assets. All oh, right, these are excellent. We're going to save all of these in the chat. Equity, helping people to get to the same place regardless of experiences. All right, excellent. So we took some of these definitions from multiple sources. In general, we, um, and you all basically covered it all. Diversity, including things like race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, socioeconomic status, language, disability, ability, age political perspective, religious commitment, equity moving into promoting justice, uh, impartiality, and fairness, and inclusion essentially is putting diversity into action, um, authentically bringing traditionally excluded individuals and our groups into processes, activities, decision making in a way that shares power and ensures equal access to opportunities and resources. So diversity again is more of that presence and inclusion is putting it into action. So in other words, to sum up, DEI, um, whoops, there we go. Okay, uh, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. Okay, so as I said before, this is the SRA special session that was formed for Denver 2020. The social responsibility intersection works to um, help professional learning networks to have more equitable exposure for the work that they do. This started in Atlanta uh, 2019 when our past past chair, Dr. Carter Wrinkle, uh, did a panel voices from within the margins of TESOL and ethnodramatic performance. And as um, he worked with that presentation, we tried to figure out what we were going to do for 2020. Um, I was reading a book by Jasper Puar looking at naming and disability. Um, Raya was also looking at presentations from Aya Teffel on disability. And together we came up with uh, diversifying TESOL and working towards inclusion. And this also happens to be one of the recommendations from the really wonderful group, the Divorce Task Force, also formed by TESOL. So we're continuing this conversation of inclusion. And with that, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists. We have Ethan Trin, they, them, Vietnamese immigrant teacher, passionate about teaching and researching about queer teachers. They served as the co-editor for the SRIS newsletter and is um, currently serving as co-chair-elect and the chair-elect for the LGBT PLN for TESOL International. Ethan enjoys a cup of iced coffee with milk and creative writing in their free time. Ha Nguyen, she, her, is a doctoral candidate in North Carolina State University, college-level lecturer and teacher trainer in Vietnam before she was she pursued a master's degree in, in the USA as a Fulbrighter and invited to the UNHCR to meeting online for refugees in 2019 in June. We have Rana Jamal Shihar. She is from Gaza, Palestine, a founding member of the Herrick Youth Center in Gaza, where she works as an educator and trauma supporter for the youth of Gaza in order for them to improve their health, be empowered, and strengthen their communities. 
works as a gender and human rights advocate and became a goodwill ambassador in 2017. Finally, we have Lavette Coney, she, her. She's an African-American African woman from Roxbury, Massachusetts, predominantly a black and brown neighborhood of Boston. And she is um, a member of TESOL's CPC and the former chair of both TESOL Diversity Collaborative and Bellpath. She recognizes the structural nature of racism and how it manifests in all spaces and where she works and volunteers. She has given numerous presentations, workshops, and lectures uh, her work can be found in a number of scholarly journals, and her most recent work can be found in social justice and English language teaching, and of course, uh, the My TESOL Lounge Live presentation. I'm Anastasia Kowaja, she, her. I am a senior instructor at Inter University of South Florida, adjunct professor of humanities and uh, the English departments. I am past co-chair of the Social Responsibility Intersection and past chair for the TESOL Palestinian Friends and Professional Learning Network. I'm currently part of the TESOL Membership Professional Council, and I currently research a global peace education and breaking the binary understanding of Israeli and the Palestinian conflict through language use and language exploration. I am co-moderator for this, and my other co-moderator -mo co is Raya Warner, she, her. She's a PhD student in language and literacies education at Ontario Institute of Studies and Education. And her research focuses on teachers in the Cote d'Ivoire can use uh, arts to teach English. She's worked as an English teacher and teacher trainer in the Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Ecuador, Thailand, and South Korea. She is past co-chair for SRIS, and she is the founder and chair of the Arts and Creativity Professional Learning Network. Welcome, all of our panelists, and let's get started. We also have the links to the intersections and PLNs represented in this panel. We will also provide those links in the chat. And we also have, oh, let's go back. Okay, so without further ado, we turn this over to our first presenter, Ethan Trim, and they will present on. Good morning, y'all. I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I see like someone's waving, someone's smiling, and I think it's great to start, you know, the Monday morning. So I hope everyone has a good day, um, you know, have a good sleep, and we have a good energy to start, you know, a new week. Um, so I'm very honored to be, you know, sitting in this panel and, you know, share my, um, some of my work with you all. Um, so I will share my screen. Um, I don't know where I can do that. Uh, wait for a second. Bottom. Um, You'll see bottom. Okay, screen. gotcha. Cool. Let me see where is that. Um, share. This one, not this one. Okay, <clears throat> and then present. Can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Okay. So uh, again, uh, my name is Ethan Trin. Um, so I'm going to, um, you know, kind of like give some of the ideas of uh, that's uh, my work that I've been working on. And I think, you know, that if we want to talk about diversifying um, and if we want to talk about diversifying TESO, so I think should, it should start with itself. Uh, and my pronoun is they, them. I'm um, um, pursuing doctorate degree at Georgia State University with a minor in women's study. Um, yeah, so there is my email. Um, and before I start my presentation, I would say special thanks to Dr. Gertrude Tinkasach, uh, my advisor at Georgia State University and other um, critical scholar who have crossed path um, before me so that I can continue the work. Um, so I think like, let's start with ourselves. So I think it should be, you know, going where, who we are and where we come from and what inspires us. So um, this me, um, you know, I come from Vietnam um, as an immigrant um, and um, currently I'm working at TESO International as um, the co-chair elect at the SRIS and also like chair elect at the LGBT PON uh, Professional Learning Network. 
Um, I'm studying at Georgia State University. I'm a teacher educator, and my inspiration is um, Gloria and Zidua. So, um, and then because I've been, you know, I, I think like I possess a lot of like the different identities within myself. So when I am situated in the US context and, you know, the global context, usually I feel like a lot of um, kind of like in between. Um, and I encounter a lot of like struggles and a lot of like uh, conflicts within a self. And, that, um, and because I have been inspired by Gloria and Sidua, so I've been working on extending the concept of Nepalera um, or Nepala, where, you know, they talk about the in-between states and, you know, the Nepala is kind of like the side of transformation of a self where you can find the balance between, you know, yourself and, you know, the, the struggle inside and outside. Um, and that's my work. Uh, you know, um, and I think like with a change in a self, so I think I should start with perspective change, right? Um, and I have a quote from Anzadua um, saying, 21 years ago, we struggled, um, 21 years ago, we struggled with the recognition of difference within the context of commonality. Today, we grapple with the recognition of commonality with the context of difference. And this quote taken from um, this bridge we call uh, home uh, from Anzadua. And I think it still um, reflect on the situation nowadays where there's a lot of like, issues of like racism, um, inequity, um, and the differences in, not only in workplace, but also in academia. So what we can do to find the recognition of the common, commonality within the context of difference. So um, I think my work, because I do a lot of like self-reflection and I do a lot of like critical self-reflection. So one of my way to um, resist against, you know, the colonial system is to write. And I believe like in the power of writing um, that can make a social change. So I write for queer students of color, I write for queer teachers, teachers of color, I write for queer writers, student of color, for immigrant and for TESOL in general. Um, because I, every time that I use my personal lived experience to connect with people, I feel like there's a strong connection and I can feel like um, there's, a, there's a way out um, to connect people on a global context. Um, so here's some of my um, questions before I start to teach or before I start to research or before I stop writing. Um, so in terms of like teaching, um, I say that I want to teach to challenge um, heteronormative, heteropatriarchy in ESO textbook. Um, I want to teach to challenge the binary assumption. I want to teach to encourage people to make the critical reflection and then to be an activist for themselves. And you have to teach to continuously reflect a question who you are as a teacher. Um, and one of my thing that I usually do is to set a common rouse for my student. And especially when we talk about um, the gender equity. So I usually have a gender pronouns in ESOL class. So first of all, I say, you know, and first of all, let me tell you, it's sometimes it's very hard for the student to be aware of like the gender pronoun. And some of the students ask me like, why we have to do this? So we have a discuss about that. We practice with the student and we learn how to use that in speaking and writing. And I have, and if you make mistakes, apologize, correct yourself, and so be mindful of the gender pronoun in the future communication. And there is, um, you know, the link uh, from Gusen, so you can use uh, to know more about um, the gender pronouns. And um, because I consider myself as non-binary, um, queer feminist, um, she kind of feminist um, person. So I, last week we have like an non international non-binary people's day week. So I think this kind of like 
give us some of um, kind of like the, the ideology or some kind of like the awareness. You know, instead of using his, her, you can try theirs or ladies and gentlemen, maybe like distinguished guests, you know, some, so try to use um, um, the non-binary words as much as you can. Um, and what next? Um, reflect continuously on your practice for the purpose of self-actualization and self-development as a teacher. And here are some of the questions that I have. So before you create a lesson plan, ask yourself, what purposes should the curriculum serve? So for who? For what purpose? Who am I as a teacher? What is my linguistic identity? What is my relationship between my national identity and those of my students? And how uncomfortable will I feel when I discuss about the issue of gender, identity, race with my student? And how uncomfortable will my student feel when they were exposed to that topic? And what are the lessons learned? Because I remember bell hooks talk about, you know, how uncomfortable, you know, when you have a conversation with your student and your student like avoid to talk about that. And it is where the engaged pedagogy is talking, right? So I believe in that. Uh, this is the references that I have. And that is my personal information, like from Twitter, from LinkedIn, from academia. So that's something about myself. Thank you so much, Ethan, for that presentation. Our next presenter is Han Nguyen, who is going to be continuing the conversation in a specific context. Ha, if you want to share your screen. All right, can you all see my screen? Awesome. So thank you very much, Anastasia, for the introduction and good morning, everyone. As you may already know, the TSO's Diverse uh, Voices Task Force has a webinar earlier last week on a similar topic, inclusion, um, creating a culture of inclusion in TESOL. So I'm here today to represent the non-native English language teachers population. I build my presentation upon my initial, uh, upon the, the initial work of the task force uh, to continue the dialogue to propose, and I will propose strategies to address diversity and equity issues, particularly for non-native English language teachers population within the TESOL association and in the field. The strategy are based on the literature of my experience as a non-native English language speaker who has learned and taught in the developing countries for nearly 35 years, as well as what I learned from my communication at the United Nations meeting in Denmark last year. So my speech has four parts. First, I will tell you about myself, why I represent the non-native English language teacher population to propose strategies. I will then briefly describe challenges that this population of teachers may face, and then I will focus mainly on strategies. We will have a Q&A session at the end, so I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, my presentation is catered to non-native English language teachers. However, it is also applicable to other historically marginalized groups in TESOL as well. So first of all, some information about myself. I am Hà Nguyễn from Vietnam. I am an English language classroom teacher, a professional learning specialist, and a leader with more than 10 years of experience from elementary to high school and at um, college level in Asia and in the USA. Um, so you can see here in the picture, I used to teach English language to pre-service and in-service teachers, English learners, adult learners for five years in Vietnam. In 2013, I taught in secondary school in Indonesia. I also participated in Vietnam's National Foreign Language Project 2020 by training in-service teachers in seven cities and provinces in Thailand and central Vietnam before coming to the U.S. for higher education. 
I have worked closely with the U.S. Embassy and with TISO, the um, a branch of TISO organization in Vietnam, to organize um, with TISO International Conference every year. And I have co-founded the TISO Association, the first and only association for teachers in Vietnam. And I also deliver webinars as well for them in Vietnam. So you can see I am familiar with the conditions of being a teacher in developing countries. Also having uh, experience in different education system, Vietnam, Indonesia, and in the US, I endure discrimination against non-native English uh, speaking teachers myself. They are what make my credentials for their presentations today. So you can see here in the picture. So non-native English language teachers um, endure different challenges. Um, native speakerism and lack of resources and so forth. So today I will focus on uh, the two main challenges. First of all, native speakerism. I, I'll give you one minute to read the job advertisement on the slide and see what is what stands out to you. You can leave your comment in the chat box. Yes, I can see some comments here. Thank you very much. So we can see the image features a white man, right? And also the populations or the um, countries of origins are very specific as well. So you can... Um, thank you very much. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Yeah, so... This job advertisement is one of far too many that exhibit discriminatory practices in hiring English language teachers based on native language, according to Levis 2016. In certain countries, for example, South Korea and China, there is even more, um, how can I say, worse. Um, teachers are required to be white and Western looking, just like you can you notice in the in the chat. According to research, approximately seventy five percent of all job ads published online are for native English speaking teachers only. And the sample on this slide actually was the one that I received from a large international company who invited me two years ago to be the headhunter to recruit American students in my department to teach English in Vietnam. So when I asked the director if I can recruit non-native English speaking teachers who speak English fluently and knows how to teach, the answer is they must be passport holders of these listed countries. So this is the first challenge. The second challenge is lack of resources. Challenges that non-native English teachers in developing countries face are somewhat unique as a result of the social economic characteristics of developing countries. These challenges include heavy teaching loads, big class size, uh, ill-equipped classroom, lack of resources and funding, lack of high quality PD opportunities. So you can see in the picture, this lack of resources is rather common in many developing countries and underdeveloped countries. In some parts of Vietnam, my country, students do not have sandals to wear to schools and we do not have tables and textbooks. Also, when I was in uh, teaching in Vietnam, oftentimes my classes were um, 40 students and sometimes I had to teach two classes combined, making 80 students classroom and I was teaching English skills. Um, so in Thailand, the situation is the same. Um, NUM ORAP 2013 reported that most Thai teachers are required 
to teach more than 18 hours a week on average. We do not have lots of PD, and if we do, we may not have time to go to PD sites like in person, and uh, or many of them are not you know, high quality. So with those challenges, what can we do as the largest association in the field of TISO for the population that we represent? So I in, propose these strategies. What we should do within the association and what we should do outside the association. First of all, within the association, we improve the presence in TSO association for underrepresented groups in general, and this non-native non English language speaking teachers uh, population in particular, in all areas such as leadership, featured presentations, newsletter publications, recipients of scholarships, awards, grants, uh, presentations, um, and so forth. Um, in the reality, um, as um, our um, Deborah Hilley um, stated, as for the leadership in TISO Association, so far we had the first elected non-native English speaker, Jun Liu, as president in uh, 2004. Our first Latina president, Luciana de um, Oliveira, in 2016. So our current board of leadership has 11 leaders who represent eight different countries uh, through birth, citizenship, and uh, own residency. So how to develop diverse leaders for TISO Association at all levels? I mean, like in both central leadership board and in entry sessions. So we should encourage members from different groups to apply. Um, we can give some discounts for conference registration for leaders um, so that those you know, leaders who come from developing countries, um, they can come to the in-person meetings at the conference and they do not feel intimidated to join leadership boards because they may be afraid that they cannot be present at TISO events to fulfill their leadership's roles. Uh, right now, in light of the pandemic, people are more familiar with Zoom online meetings. So I think that online meetings should be used more often now and in the future so that non-native English speaking teachers from developing countries can participate from their home and feel more inclusive. And we also should be uh, more mindful in the demography of awardees, presenters, and the range of topics presented and published in TESOL um, association uh, so that we do not advocate for a particular viewpoints or particular group's interests. We should report on how to so address diversity and inclusion within the association and also in other companies. We um, should have smart goals and be transparent on the efforts and results. We should report the numbers of membership awardees leadership on TISO website so that everybody can keep updated. Um, next one, we should organize um, periodically town halls to update members of diversity and um, inclusion um, situation within the association. We can help increase dialogues between uh, TISO and public members and also receive recommendations and suggestions from the members. Um, I think um, the task force um, did a very good uh, thing last week when they asked for, they created a Google Doc after the, the webinar to ask for uh, suggestions from the members. And, and I think that it should be a practice that we, we do after each town hall. The next one, we should promote dialogue between groups. Uh, we create a space for dialogues among members and different interest sessions. Right now, uh, we have different sessions, but we don't have yet a lot of communication and collaboration in place um, between these sessions. So I think creating a space like this webinar uh, with the voices from different groups can help fostering solidarity, mutual understanding, and better collaboration for a common course. Um, the next strategies focus on um, building people. Increase resources. We can ask for more funding sponsorships from companies 
and philanthropists. And also we um, ask for mentorships from senior educators. So resources can come in different forms and not only in terms of finance. Um, we should raise awareness as well because we already have a lot of resources um, provided by TESOL. I mean, I'm amazed when I look for resources, you know, um, on TESOL website. Uh, however, I think not many people know where to find information. So I suggest in, for new members, we include a letter with information on uh, what is available for the PD and how to navigate on the TESOL website uh, when they sub subscribe um, or we can become the, the member. For existing members, we should regularly have reminders of resources in newsletters. Next one, I, uh, I think it's very important to provide mentorship for presenters, for those who want to present at conference. Maybe they don't know how to write a proposal, how to get funding to be confident to apply um, in the first place. And for those who want to publish articles as well, like for new, um, for early, researchers and those who want to participate in interest sessions. The next one is connecting people. Um, I can myself consider TESOL as a liaison between TESOL professionals and schools, organizations, and industry. TESOL provides information of who and what, who is hiring, who, is, who are past scholarship winners, who are mentors, uh, job ads, and create space to connect everybody together um, after the COVID-19 outbreak, I think online learning and technology have become a new normal. So TESOL can create online job fairs or um, meetings uh, to help with this, connecting people. I'm sorry, I'll give you about a minute, but you need to wrap up in about a minute, please. Sure. Um, sure, yeah. I'm sorry, this part is a little bit long. Um, I do have more strategies. So i um you know we do um we should increase like more professional development uh, opportunities for um this group of uh, this population uh through MOOCs, webinars live stream of convention sessions for a fee or we can provide even awards or scholarships for you know um, this population and we already have online courses i think um we can just build on that and um you know outside association we can do more lobbying uh, with uh, the garments, um, not only in the US, but also in other countries. Um, I can answer more quick, um, your question regarding these strategies. Um, and we should react to systemic discrimination by saying no to, um, you know, uh, hiring companies that discriminate um, this population in job fair and also in sponsorship and, you know, um, organizing meetings. So in conclusion, I really want to, um, include the, um, um, our um, uh, Deborah Hewley uh, in the task force core. The success of TESO Association in meeting um, all the outcomes um, and to become the, you know, um, pow powerful, we must have diverse reps, uh, representation in TESO events, publications and leaderships and our programs and activities must be inclusive. So in conclusion, I think that we need to take stronger steps and measures to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion within the association and the field. And these are the outlines that I have talked about, the references and reflection questions and you know my um, email address and LinkedIn. So thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Ha, for that presentation. Our next presenter is Rana Jamal Kwafa, and she is coming on Zoom from Gaza, Palestine. So Rana, if you can go ahead and share your screen, you have the floor. A minute. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk without sharing any screens. Okay. okay. Just to see. Yeah, this is, I think, a little bit better. Um, I am Rana. I was working in United, at United Arab Emirates before I come here to Gaza in 2013. So uh, I was working uh, as a teacher, um, a class teacher. I was teaching um, English as the second language for Arabic uh, students. I was teaching mathematics in English, science, geography, and other languages for non-Arabic speakers in English. So. Um, reverse. I was teaching um, English speakers and Arabic speakers at the same time. 
um, I came to Gaza and uh, I started working as a translator, trainer, and a teacher for adults and uh, young students as well. But that will be a uh, tutoring because I am uh, not a teacher in a school here in Gaza. So I started, uh, I founded a Hirak Youth Center because uh, in a study when, when we, uh, when I came to Gaza with a group of uh, young volunteers who, who were uh, looking for a change in the community, we were studying the situation and we found out that um, people are, uh, people need to overcome the traumas, the continuous traumas that they face every day because of the blockade, because of the uh, several attacks from the uh, Israelis on the little, little tiny piece of land which called Gaza, and um, uh, the, the poverty that people are suffering from. Also, it is because of what is going on. So uh, we worked on training that, uh, um, uh, that training is concentrates on body and mind uh, trainings, okay, to overcome uh, the trauma problems and other psychological problems that adults and children are dealing uh, with every day. And um, uh, when it comes to teaching, we found out that when, when you, uh, teach someone a, a skill that is not familiar to his uh, or her uh, that he, he will not deal with every day something different that what they deal with every day it makes the people the person concentrate on that new skill that uh, strengthen his ability especially when he gets the uh, 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 the right help with the new skill. So we found out when we teach a language, something that they can open up with uh, to talk about uh, their situation in Gaza to the world, they can sing with, they can write with, they can even speak their secrets with when they don't want people around them uh, to do this. So this will give uh, people um, an extra um, self-esteem Okay, and, and that will help them to overcome the traumas that um, uh, they are facing. Okay, uh, the challenges are so many here in Gaza. When we come to the regular teaching in, in classrooms, uh, whether it is honor classes uh, where the honor is uh, uh, taking care of um, a, a group of, uh, of schools in, in Gaza, or when it comes to uh, governmental uh, schools, and that will be when they when they go to high school, it is governmental. Before that, it is UNRWA who are controlling uh, the the education uh, or taking uh, taking the lead of, uh, of of the education in Gaza. We see that the number of students in the classes are so big. It sometimes it is 55 to 60 students per class. And when we're talking to foundation classes like uh, grade one and two, it is really important to have list number so the teacher can uh, 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 teach them the way it should be. Uh, we're talking about also uh, the, the educators themselves, the teachers are not well prepared with uh, educational tools that can um, enhance uh, uh, the students to, to to learn uh, or to love the language the way it should be. So we are working on this uh, in a different way. Uh, like um, we have big groups of, of clowns who can teach the language in a, in a funny way. Uh, we bring them here to, to groups. I'm here sitting in, the, in one of the rooms that um, at the center, we have books, we have toys, we have, uh, we have uh, educators uh, who are trained to uh, to work with the, with the students the way it should be. Also, we are working on parents, mothers and children, mothers and uh, and fathers, to uh, make the, the the amount of the stress less on them, so they can deal with their children uh, the way uh, it should be. Um, uh, so many uh, other problems, if you want to talk about, uh, like um, the absence of uh, healthy uh, 
water or or the medicine and other stuff and and that we're trying to um uh, to uh, to make from those people survivals that they can survive with with the things that they have for 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 now till things get better in the future um what what we want um from uh, the community from us as trainers and teachers uh, to, to change the reality of, of learning the languages, uh, especially learning English inside uh, Gaza is uh, to find a new way and which, which is uh, which we are uh, is working on right now by um, uh, doing uh, signing so many agreements with, with people around the world. We have friends from Canada, friends from uh, England, uh, who can um, um, be guests, online guests, um, to to talk to the people and teach them and and try to improve um, uh, the 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 way of learning and the way of of teaching also. So uh, eight years of working in Gaza, and uh, I can tell that. Um, in, in the middle area of Gaza Strip, where, where I live, where I work, we made um, a slight change and uh, we hope that will continue. And um, uh, I don't want to say much. That's, that's all I think. Thank you. Anna, thank you so much for that presentation. I think you also had a few uh, questions that the audience can reflect upon. Yeah, I tried to put them on the slide, but it didn't work. So I sent them to you. Oh, it's okay. Um, I can put them on the slide later, but did you want to say what the questions were and then we'll go over the um, Q&A collectively at the end? Well, um, I'll, I'll see at the end, I'll see what, what I'll say. Yeah. I can read Rana's questions also so people can start thinking about them now. So Rana, had the questions, many adult, many children and adults in my community suffer from the difficulty of learning the English language due to the lack of correct educational methods for dealing with learners. How can TESOL through its training programs better communicate information to teachers and learners of all ages? Can we integrate teaching English as a language with other life skills to make the language a way of life? So we'll circle that back to that along with all the other presenters' reflection questions after our next presenter, who is Lavette Coney. Lavette, are you ready to share your screen? Great. All right. I'm gonna make sure I'm on um, mic. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? I'm glad to be here and um, I really appreciate what the presenters have um, provided us with prior to my presentation. All of it is very relevant to um, what we're doing. So in terms of diversity, um, I just wanna give a little background about myself. Um, I am the, sorry, I am the leader of a number of different organizations, one of them being White People Challenging Racism. The organization has been around for 20 years. I'm the first African-American female uh, leader of this organization that helps white people to understand their uh, humanity by dismantling racism. Um, so, and, and also too, I'm an activist in my community where a uh, black and brown community where there are a number of different underlying issues um, that are present. And so I am happy to be able to have the, this format to be able to share my thoughts. Um, I'm trying to put this in uh, presentation mode. Okay. So when we think about diversity, um, everyone has talked about the definitions of diversity and uh, what it means to them. But diversity is um, interesting because it is, um, has a lot of, it's a buzzword and it's been co-opted and it's much more complicated than um, most people um, can even uh, imagine. So uh, Webster's um, definition is here for all of you to see. 
Uh, notice how in this definition, they provide you with items of, in, of, of, in, of inclusion, but also identities that we all share. So um, when looking at that, um, I'm just curious to know if, if in the chat, if you could, sorry, I have a number of different um, screens open. Um, if you can go inside of the chat and, and um, write down, what do you notice there and out of all of those identifiers, all of those um, human identifiers, diversity identifiers, um, which ones do you think are not real? Which one of those out of national origin, gender, age, disability, uh, military status, ethnicity, status, race, which one of those items do you think is not real? Can you please type it in the chat? Which one do you think is not real? Lavette, we can't see the screen anymore, so people can't see that list right now. Okay, so what should I do? Um, so I'm not shared at all? No, we just see the video of you, not your screen. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can see it now, but it's not in presenter mode. It's not in presenter mode, and so... Presentation. Mm -hmm. Now it's back, thank you. All right, so um, if I look at the chat, has anyone started to write in the chat? Um, So what do we have in the chat? Can someone tell me? So, so in the chat, we have military status a couple of times. The question, by real, do you mean socially constructed? Right, that's what I'm trying to get to, but I just want to see if anyone knows that. So that's why I'm just wondering, if they, if they didn't say race, then that means they don't understand that race is socially constructed and it doesn't exist. It's not Real. Yeah, there's race is three people have it type was... race, along with color, socioeconomic status. All of them are real. Um, so those are the responses I'm seeing. Okay, good. So my my screen just disappeared. I'm sorry. Where? I'm sorry, but my screen disappeared. So I'm gonna have to come out and come back in again. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Okay, so uh, let's look at the uh, diversity identifiers. As you can see, it's very complex and that we hold all these different identities. So if we hold all these different identities, how do we make sure that we are cognizant of it in our pedagogy and also within ourselves and our colleagues and how we interact with one another? So it's important for us to take all of these identifiers into consideration. So intersectionality as well, as you can see, all of these um, are overlapping and these identities that a lot of people don't understand how oppression and domination and discrimination work in some of these because some of them are uplifted and, and others aren't. So it's very important to understand that aspect as well in, in the intersectionality and identifiers. So here are a couple of images to, to demonstrate how structures and, hello? Um, how structures impede on this ability to, to, to access equity and, and inclusion and justice. Um, and, um, I'm not sure if some people are aware of some of the, of this image is very popular right now. Uh, the first one, um, when people think of diversity, they think about equality, but not understanding that, you know, you, you see everyone has a box but some people don't, some of them don't need a box, but yet they're given a box. Whereas equity gives extra boxes to those who need it. 
Whereas, with, whereas justice, you remove the barriers, meaning the structural items that are in place, the systems that prevent people from acquiring justice, from us for, for, um, acquiring justice within not only the field, but also within the organization. And here's another um, image as well, which um, has that last step as being liberated. So removing those barriers provides more opportunities for everyone to engage in our field and in the organization. So here again, you'll see these identifiers and how some are uplifted and some are not. And how domination plays a role in all of these identifiers and also oppression and how, how also too, there's resistance as well, but also too, there's this domination and, and privilege that's you know, seeped in not only the field, but also in our organization. Um, if, are there any questions coming up, Anastasia? Uh, no, just comments about the justice pick. Um, and then there are comments about um, race seems to be seen as immutable, which is a problem. And then uh, that's why teachers should continue to address and speak and discuss race in our curriculum. And generally that is. I would also like to add that also, we have to do some self-reflection, right? We have to look inward. So yes, we have to do that in the classroom. We have to make sure that's on the walls, but also too, we need to do it ourselves as well because we didn't get that in our education. I'm a, my assumption is after doing my research is that most education programs for teachers do not thread this throughout their their um, learning when they're in the teacher education programs. You may, there are some universities and colleges that have it for it as a one course that you might take on inclusion, diversity, equity, and uh, social justice. But it's, it, it's, it's rare. I don't know if, if it is. I wish someone would set, put it in the uh, chat. What university provides it and threads it throughout your whole time that you're like learning how to be a teacher because I haven't found a program that does that. And because it doesn't do that, we don't do a good enough job. That's why we need to do our own self-reflective practice and also our own professional development. So how oppression works. Many people don't understand how oppression works. Oppression, when people think of oppression and, and, and particularly racism, because if we're thinking about decentering whiteness in TESOL, the field, in TESOL, the organization, you're gonna to have to grapple with white supremacy and, and racism. So when you're doing that, you need to understand how it works. Ideologies and then uh, institutions and interpersonal and in how we internalize all of that oppression and also racism. So most people, when they think about racism, they think about racism as being interpersonal between people. And it's way more than that. It's complicated. As you can see, all these rings interconnect. Um, They're not separable. You can't separate them. But most people only look at it as interpersonal and you cannot because you have to incorporate the power that is there. And that power prevents people from entering and, and, and for, from us having social justice and liberation. So um, I'll just read this really quick. Um, race is a construct of power and whiteness was codified as the most powerful racial group as soon as it was created. So um, this person who wrote the article, he says um, his article makes the case that what, he, what we promise our students by teaching them English in the way that we do is the additional power of relative proximity to whiteness. But because some students can never truly be seen as white and avoid being racialized, this is unattainable. It is an unattainable goal and it's harmful. So the, the closer you get to being white is to be able to speak the English language. And as we know, it's, it's a colonial language and there's all these other historical pieces and baggage that's associated with English teaching. So um, here's um, another quote from um, um, a, a TESOL um, professional. 
By whitewashing our views of race, culture, and language, we lose the um, spectacular wonder of our differences, the benefits of what we can achieve when we work together with people with different backgrounds and perspectives. And another uh, T. Soller, I know there was more to this issue, but unaware of my own privilege and unaware of the histories of others that had not been a visible part of my education, my focus was centered on helping diverse students and parents conform to the expectations of the dominant culture without understanding all the invisible bar barriers and conflicts of interest that were occurring behind the scenes. In, in, uh, in the chat, I'm just curious if you could um, chat, when you think of L's and you think of the images of L's, not only in textbooks and advertisements, which group is predominantly focused, which ethnic groups are pre pre predominantly focused in your, your experience in your, in your life as a, as a um, TESOL professional? Can I see that in the chat? Well, we see Latinx, Latinos in the US, Hispanic students, Asian populations, Refugees, Latinx, Haitian Americans, Latinx in K-12, Asian, uh, Asian in higher ed, Latinx and some Asians, Albanian students. So that, that proves my point. So black out. Those who are poor working class, oh, sorry. Thank you. So um, black L's are um, the unique, their unique history and needs and identification and experience of black L's is an important part of supporting them socially, emotionally, and academically. But I believe that most teachers don't specifically look at black L's. They may clump, put them together with Dominican Republic, uh, people from Dominican Republic or people from other Latinx countries and don't look at their specific needs, especially when they're placed in the United States in the U US context how they're perceived as African-Americans and, and it's a new phenomenon for them as well. Uh, TESOL, the organization, the, um, that shift must be structural, methodological, pedagog um, pedagogical, and also generational. These organizations must be re-envisioned and rebuilt and, um, and they're not gonna be able to do it with offering IBPOCs which means indigenous, black, and people of color. Here are my reflection questions. Um, how can uh, you, um, as a professional, TESOL professional, it's 12 come from a place of knowing, empathy, and humanity? And when I say come from a place of knowing, you have to do your own learning because you didn't get it in your education, um, teacher education programs. How does a um, post-pandemic um, Black Lives Matter look to you in terms of how we move forward in TESOL, the field, in TESOL, the organization? And how can you use your agency to decenter uh, whiteness and dismantle systems of white supremacy in our field? So if you want citations and slides, um, you can just email me. I'm done, thank you. All right, so thank you so much to Levette and thank you to all of our presenters. So far we had Ethan and we had Ha, and Rana and Lavette, we're now going to share a slide that has all of these different reflection questions and we'll start that off and then we will take your questions in the chat. Okay. Lavette, can you stop sharing your screen so I can put up all the discussion questions? Thank you. So can everyone see the list of discussion questions? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> Great. So we asked each presenter to come up with a reflection question to get this uh, conversation started after the presentations. Um, we've had a lot of really powerful ideas today, but it's important that we don't just attend this webinar and then forget about everything we learned here today afterwards. So we need to practice internalizing these ideas, reflecting on them 
for ourselves as well as how we can put them into practice, both as individual teachers and tea sellers, as well as as an organization on a more structural level. So uh, Ethan had the question, what does a critical self-reflection mean to you? And what impact has critical self-reflection helped you build pedagogical practices in the ESOL classrooms? Ha asked, to what degrees do the strategies she proposed apply to your programs? And what other strategies would you recommend to improve diversity and equity for NNESTs in the TESOL Association and in the field after the COVID-19 outbreak? Rana said that many adults and children in her community suffer from the difficulty of learning English due to the lack of correct educational methods for dealing with learners. How can TESOL, through its training programs, better communicate information to teachers and learners of all language, of all ages, sorry, and can we integrate teaching English as a language with other life skills? to make the language a way of life. And finally, Levette asked, how can you come from a place of knowing, empathy, and humanity? How does a post-pandemic Black Lives Matter TESOL look to you? And how can you use your agency to decentralize whiteness and dismantle systems of white supremacy, white supremacy in our field? So does anyone have thoughts on any of these discussion questions? Anything you'd like to respond to in response to these presentations? Um, I can no longer see the chat box. So Anastasia, can you let me know? Okay, I found the chat box. So there are okay so i think ethan copied and pasted the questions um i see various questions i don't see responses to the reflections yet um so what i'm seeing is uh there's a lot more questions that are being generated so if anyone would like to unmute yourself and respond either by asking a question in response or by sharing um, your response to the presentations. Feel free to do that. And just a reminder, this is all recorded and will be available within the day. So if you're missing anything, you can always go back and watch it. Do any of our presenters have responses to each other's reflection questions? Yeah. Great. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> this is me, Ahmed Ibrahim. I'm from Egypt. Uh, I'm an English teacher and for non-speakers uh, or non-native non speakers or other languages. <clears throat> so uh, the most important thing about the diversity, I think we should think or put more um, uh, attention to the, the reflection of how can we deal with the new cases or how can we deal with the new perspectives. So there is a very important element, I think it should be uh, um, put, we have to make it as an important element in, in each uh, association, in each organization, that we have to think about accepting the new uh, skills or new perspectives, at least at least to apply the, the big, big uh, idea of uh, 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 introducing yourself to the others and uh, introduce the um, uh, modern or more sophisticated skills to the new uh, comers or the new learners. Um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you for sharing that perspective. Yeah. Does anyone welcome. else have something to add? Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Hello, I'm Jim. I'm from the Philippines. It's 12.07 in the morning here, so good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I just have a question for Ha. I actually loved her presentation. Okay, as a non-native speaker and non-native teacher myself, I just want to ask, uh, how would you change the perspectives of the students? Because sometimes the demands for native, native, native English language teachers came from them or come from them. So how would you change the perspective of students toward non-native English language teachers? Hi, Jim. Thank you very much for your question and uh, thank you very much for your encouragement. So I just want to make sure that I get your question correctly. You mean how can we change perspectives of students toward non-native teachers? Is that correct? Yes. Mm. I think, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you uh, very much for that. Um, from my experience uh, of working in Vietnam, in Indonesia, and in the US, I think that um, I think the discrimination comes from the lack of understanding um, because you know some students they do not have a lot of um, exposures to um, you know um, either one um, either non-native teachers and native uh, teachers or both um, you know um, um, and have that both groups to be that teachers so they don't have the you know, the comparison and I think um, I think as a non-native teachers I would improve I, I mean I would look um, I would reflect on myself first to see you know if I have um, if I am well equipped with knowledge skills um, you know and characteristics that are required for um, you know um, the teaching job and um, I will try to do my best. And I think like once I improve myself, like personally and professionally, and I show that I, my passion in teaching and through the interaction with students, I think I will make them understand that I also have um, the quality of teaching doesn't depend on um, the native language, but, on, but depends on the um, qualifications on the characteristics and on the knowledge and skills that we can present to, to them and uh, what can we do for them you know to help them in their uh, learning journey so um, I think that's um, I mean that's my question for now um, because I'm very passionate about teaching at first I when I went to Indonesia um, and you know some other um, like um, countries uh, as a teacher I endured some discrimination and like some, you know, um, judgment about my teaching um, ability. And I think after, after some times they saw, you know, that they could make improvement as well, you know, with me. So they, you know, gradually accept me as a teacher and we build very good bonding after that. So yeah, that's my answer. Oh uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, for Ethan, I have this question. Um, how would I integrate diversity and inclusion or the concept of it if I'm teaching in a conservative country, for example, Saudi Arabia or other Middle Eastern countries? How would I integrate diversity and inclusion? Hey, Jim. Um, thank you for your questions. And I think um, the question is really, it's complex in the way that, you know, I don't think we have kind of like a, a fixed answer for that. But in terms of like conservative, I would say, you know, I think everything starts with a self of a teacher and how does a teacher make a reflection on how they want to teach. And I think, um, you know, the focus on the discussion, the focus on, you know, the engaging discussion where the student and the teachers are exposed to the ideology of, you know, the binary, but also the exposed to the discussion of, you know, that is not right, that is not wrong. 
um, there is a, a scene, you know, for example, being queer, being gay is a scene. How can you develop the student thinking and questions about the norms, the normativity? And I think like it is very hard and it takes time to move forward. I mean, to, to change the student perspective, you know, in a short period of time. But what I am thinking is to embed into the discussion with the student about what do you think about this? And what if, you know, some of the embed into some of the critical questions that, that questions the norm, that questions about the society that they are in, right? that questions where, who they are and who you are as a teacher and how or what we can do together. So, and, and I think the discussion also come from the bravery, right? Like kind of like some, some of the discussion that it risks your job, it risks your life sometimes in some um, certain countries. But how can you move forward? How can you change the student perspective would be kind of the starting point to initiate more um, discussion, not inside the classroom, but also like outside of the classroom. And I think I try to relate to Lavette, talk about, you know, the four eyes, about the identity, about the interpersonal, the institutional, and all kind of those of, of the eyes intertwined together and you have to to work one by one you have to break down those binary you have to work on those thinking with the student and i don't and to be honest with you i've been working with my student for a couple of years and it's a hard job and sometimes i encounter the the barriers i encounter the resistance from from the student from the institution where I'm working at, but but do you you have to ask yourself why do you want to do that? Why and what and which population that you are serving for? So I guess it's, I don't have an answer for that, but I think I'm I'm gearing toward you know the ideas of working in a community with the critical questions and everything stuff with itself. Thanks so much. Hey, Okan, you had something to add? Yeah, um, hello, I'm Okan from Doha, Qatar. I want to add to what uh, Ha was saying about um, how we can raise learners and awareness to diversity. I think beyond um, recruitment policies, um, the enrollment policy of the different institutions or language institutes or colleges, before students can actually start their program, they could be made aware in like in a policy document that your teacher may be from any ethnic background, from ethnic race. So you don't have to come in on day one and then see somebody you don't like and then you change your class. So that could be one way to raise learners awareness. So diversity. I have an American friend, she's Chinese American. She's never been to China, born in America, but she was recruited to teach uh, a bunch of Chinese learners who came into America to learn English. They walked into her class day one. She didn't even open her mouth to say hello. They walked out of the class. They just walked out on her as if, hey, I didn't come all the way from China to America to learn English from a Chinese. But they didn't even wait to hear her accent, to hear her speak. So this sort of a thing can really help if the recruitment, I mean, the enrolling institutions can make the students know that your teacher can come from anywhere in the world. Then also to add to what um, Ethan was saying, responding to the question about um, somebody in the Middle East. I mean, um, in trying to raise awareness to diversity, equity, and inclusion, there may be bigger barriers to this effort. I, for instance, here in the Middle East, there are no-go areas. I mean, there are certain top topics I cannot raise in the classroom because of cultural sensitivity. So we try as much as possible. Maybe we can strike gender, gender balance or color balance, but there are some topics that we cannot even think of mentioning it in the classroom with the student, even though it's 
obvious that they know we know, but due to Great. Lavette, did you have something to add? I just wanted to make reference to the four eyes again. So being the internalized in for oppression of internalized um, aspects, you have to think about the individual, why they're thinking that way. They are also non-native speakers of English. So they might even sound like that. So why would they want to discriminate against someone or not want to be taught by someone who may sound like them in, in the future or near future? So in understanding how oppression works, your perceived notion of how you, you, how you think that you're inferior is a part of that. And I teach even my middle school students about the structures and about the four eyes and why is it that you think that way? It's because of your education and because of you know, your society and how they view it and what that all means in that whole process of the uh, four eyes. Anyone else have something to say in response? Um, Raya, if I could add. Of course. Hi, uh, this is George just from Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, from Greece. So I just wanted to uh, thank Hai and Akon for all the comments. Um, and I find Akon's idea very, very useful. And we have done that, I'm proud to say, in our, our university. And we do accept, as I am, a Greek teaching English in Saudi Arabia. But sometimes what I, f I find difficult, and I think we spoke about that with Keisha when um, the Diverse Voices Task Force came to the affiliate events is, these are government policies. So I think what we need to do is maybe we need to have larger conversations with government entities. So maybe this is where TESOL can get involved and, you know, educate them, you know, because sometimes decisions are taken by people who are non-educators, although they could be, you know, ministers of education or advisors to ministers or to governments and so on and so forth. So maybe this is um, something that we need to, to have a discussion with you know, the higher authorities of lots of countries. Because, um, and Akon, I'm, I'm sure he knows about that, that there's lots of Middle Eastern countries that passports are, a passport is a passport to, you know, to getting a job. And sometimes a passport is not, right? So, uh, and it's not just in the Middle East, in, it's in, in a lot of countries. So maybe something could be addressed to that extent with governments. I know it sounds like a Titan kind of task, but if we don't, we, we can start small and, you know, make it larger in the future. Thanks. Um, can, I, can I add to that? I really love your idea, um, Georgios. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, so yeah, thank you very much for bringing uh, up that idea because this is one of the strategies that I, um, at the end of my presentation, I, I ran out of time. So it's about lobbying governments. Uh, to have more support in English learning and teaching. So, um, so I, what I by that I mean this not only for the U.S. governments but also for governments around the world. Just like you just uh, said, I, I know this is ambitious, but I think that um, you know, TISO do not have to pay the money, you know, for the lobbying, but by using uh, by leveraging the advantages of being the largest association in the field of TESOL. I think TESOL Association can do a lot of things to make this happen. Uh, for example, in, um, you know, for the TESOL convention in, in Atlanta, I think like two years ago, I don't remember, I was there and um, the Viet TESOL, the Vietnam, the TESOL, uh, the Vietnam TESOL Association leadership, they were invited to attend that convention in Atlanta with the funding from the U.S. Department of State and the Regional English Language Office. And I was there in Atlanta to greet that, um, that, you know, that group. So I think that um, a lot of things that TESOL Association can do, uh, I think the main thing is to, for the association to understand uh, where we are and who we are. 
and what advantages that we have. So we are the largest association in the field and we have a lot of things that the other organizations do not have and a lot of things that hiring companies and um, the garments like may need from us. So I think using that advantage uh, to our benefits and to you know, advocate for different historically marginalized groups, I think um, can be um, you know, something like doable. Uh, uh, does that, yeah, I mean, I, again, I really like your idea. So it's just like something I'm very passionate about. So thank you. Yeah, we'll be in touch. <laughs> thanks, Ha. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> chat box so i hope people have been reading along with those would anyone who's shared your ideas in writing like to uh, share them with the group and speak or anyone else like to add a response hi this is uh carter winkle i, I think you know I, I dropped in the link to the position statements and papers and i think the association does a good job of tackling contemporary issues as they arise, but I think that there probably are a good number of our position statements that we might review and reflect on and refresh and make more contemporary. And then these can be some of the tools, sort of as Giorgio was mentioning, if we're if PSOL can do outreach to um, governments and to policymakers within governments. Now it may not change the world, but it may make some nudges in the direction that we think is is in the direction of advocacy and change so that this you know as, as others have said that the association carries a certain weight with it and so i think that maybe a refreshing of some of these uh, position statements might be something that we could tackle i don't and I, I don't know really how that works at the association level and whether that's something that um, individual members or interest sections could advocate on behalf or, or adopt position statements that, that they could do research in and contemporize. Um, but I'm just throwing that out there as a possible um, area of work that we could do as part of the SRIS. Great. Liz, you have something to add? Thank you. I think I'm unmuted. Thanks so much. I, I, I'm one of the others that Carter just referred to, uh, representing uh, TESOL members worldwide. And just to underscore uh, what Georgia said and um, Lavette too, that we have scholars, we have evidence, we have data, we have published literature, a canon in TESOL um, on which we can rely. It's not just uh, people's many tragic stories and also wonderful stories about things we've done. It's not just anecdote. We have so much to offer and um, I'm just thrilled with this event. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia and all. Um, it's overdue that we will address these issues. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we have about five more minutes before we're out of time. Does anyone have any last thoughts that you would like to share? Last uh, responses or questions for our panelists? Hi, Rhea. Can you hear yes. me? This is Keisha yeah. Bryan. I just want to thank you all for a wonderful um, session today. And I want to ask that we all go to the statement, the Diverse Voice Task Force, I'm sorry, the six principles. And if we could just provide comments on those six principles, like what are your suggestions? What do you think about the six principles? Or even what you're doing to enact the six principles, we would be grateful. Um, so I just want to thank you all again on, on behalf of the, Ver the Diverse Voices Task Force for all of your hard work and doing the hard work. I, we appreciate it. Great. And I also want to thank you, Keisha, for your work with that task force. I think that this is something that's long overdue in TESOL, looking at this, not just defining diversity, which we started at at the beginning, but moving beyond that. And that's why um, for this presentation, we started with the idea of diversity, but the goal is inclusivity and thinking about the more tangible steps that we can take as individuals and as an association. And I think that 
um, sort of the themes of this webinar are reflected in the principles that you as the diverse task, diverse voices task force have come up with. So I very much um, would like to reiterate that there's a lot of sort of synergy on these topics happening in TESOL now, and we need to make sure that that momentum stays going forward, that we don't let these things uh, drop off the radar, which has happened too often in TESOL's history. And so I um, would like to thank all of you for coming today. Um, does and highlight that this um, event uh, came about because uh, there's this need in TESOL to move beyond repeating the same things and focus on the intersectionality that Levette talked about because there's so many aspects to our diversity and our at times lack of equity and lack of inclusion. And so some, we often, uh, we talk a lot about non-native English speaking teachers, but sometimes we forget about the intersection with that and gender identity or racial identity. And so, so many of our presenters today made those connections really clear and really well articulated that I want all of us today to keep in mind the connections between these issues. And I want to highlight again the number of TESOL entities that we had working together today. So the social responsibility intersection hosted this, but we also had collaborators from the NNEST intersection, the LGBT plus PLN, the Black English Language Professionals and Friends PLM, also called BELPATH, the Palestinian Educators and Friends PLN, and the Diversity Collaborative PLN. So I invite all of you to, I believe the links are up on your screen and I will copy, oops, <laughs> I will add them to the chat box as well if I can figure out how to do that so that we can continue these conversations and so we can um, move forward as an association and keep up these discussions on my TESOL through comments on the Diverse Voices Task Force principles that Keisha invited us to comment on and just in general find ways to take our learning and implement it in our daily practices as teachers and in our practices as an institution. Because so many of these issues are, as Levette said, they're structural, methodo methodological, pedagogical, and generational. And so we need to be fostering the, this sense of inclusivity and equity across the entire organization. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and we have contact information for our presenters as well. Ethan, Ha, Rana, and Levette, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And Anastasia and I um, helped coordinate this. So we have all six of our contact information there. If you would like to reach out in um, after this presentation. So that is in the chat box as well. Thank you so much for being with us today.